Okay, guess we're, we're ready to start our meeting. I will call the meeting order at uh, 103, and I'll ask for agenda additions or an approval. If there's um, a dissenter, did you have any? I just had one that's added in red font on your okay. copy that you uh, distributed. To our agenda. And you uh, the information by email. Okay. And Mr. Gender? I'm just going to wonder on the additions or whether <clears throat> this is regarding acreages to the discussion on it, on whether we have them fenced off. Because there's, I've got one that's, there's a little bit of confrontation between the, land, the acreage owner now and the new landowner. I'm just kind of wondering how, how do we approach something like that? Mm. Where would you like to add that into the agenda? Um, in the subdivision? Uh, something that you think should be in addition to a subdivision, say like or a condition. So in the subdivision, we don't have any files today, but we could add it there. Maybe. We'll make it eight point one, and then a, an acreage concern. Okay, Mr. Gender. And is there any other additions to the agenda? It's in the camera. In camera. Okay. Well, if there are no other ones, I'll ask for it. Yes. Sorry, it hasn't been added to the agenda. The in camera memo? Okay, so. Yeah, we have an in camera memo to add. Okay. Regarding a lot at Buffalo Sands, right? Buffalo Sands lot, okay. That'll be 11.1. One. And were there any other additions? Seeing none, I'll ask for mayor. I'll move it as, uh, with additions. Okay, Mr. Clark moves the agenda with additions. All those in favor? Carried. Okay, I think now we'll um, do our introductions for those watching in from home. Um, we'll start on the far side with Rich, please. Rich Fitzgerald, development officer. Michelle Luper, legislative assistant. Derek Kushner, manager of IT. Mr. Donovan, Director of Planning Services. Mickey Thorstenson, Communications. Wes Stuhlberg, Vice Chair. Justin Stevens. Larry Clark, Board Member. Paul McCabe, Board Member. Ernie Kender, Board Member. Beck Cassidy, CEO. Okay. Thank you. The minute approval from the June 22nd, 2022 meeting. Anybody um, see Mr. Gender? I'll give you that, please. Okay. There any moves? All in favor? Carried. Was there any business arising from those minutes? If not, um, well, the delegation will be at 2 p.m. The reports uh, from the development officers on page three. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So on page three of your packet, you have the list of uh, meetings and sites we visited in the past month. We have processed uh, 48 applications for the TSA to the province. Well, we have, processed, we have issued our authorization for the use of ER for the landowners to apply for their temporary field authorization, just to be clear as to our role in that. And we currently have 102 active recreational vehicle permits, and some of those are for permanent use, and others are the temporary 21 days and the five-day permits. And uh, for our permits, last year uh, we had 101 development permits at this time, and at this time this year we are at 71 applications, so we're getting behind in our permits. The same with subdivisions, we had 17 in 2021, and uh, to date we have 12 applications that have been processed. So that's all for our report, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. Any questions for DeSantis' report? Not I'll ask for a mover. Mr. McKay? I'll do so by moving. Okay, all those in favor? Carried. Uh, moving into development permits, 7.1, DP 22066, on page 11. And uh, for the Brennans, who will take this one? 
Just send it. Okay, go ahead. So the applicant is requesting a 46% variance to the side yard setback for two existing ancillary buildings on lot three, block one plan 9720133 within the Pheasant Back Estate subdivision. A real property report for the subject property was prepared on August 16, 2019. The report indicated the two ancillary buildings are not set back the required three feet or 0 0.91 meters from the side yard property boundary. A chain link fence and mature shelter belt defines the property boundaries between the two adjoining lots. Pursuant to section 23.1 and subject to section 23.7 and 23.8, the Municipal Planning Commission may allow a variant of any rear yard or side yard setback requirement in this bylaw in order to correct an omission, error, other defect, or to address site-specific conditions, any of which, in the opinion of the Development Authority, causes unreasonable hardship and would not unduly interfere with the amenities of the neighborhood or materially interfere with or affect the use, enjoyment, or value of adjacent parcels of land. And we allow a variance of any minimum or maximum development standard in this bylaw. So we have a photo of the two buildings and a photo also of the lot adjacent to this property uh, where the uh, two buildings are located. I just want to scroll down to the next page. Maybe. Okay. So that's the two buildings that are set back the um, 0.42 meters or 0.130. It's just a 46% variance. And then the following page shows the um, that's the lot on the adjacent property. So it's been used for storage of uh, like a stockpile. Any discussion on this? Mr. Jenner? I'll move it as presented, please. Okay. Mr. Jenner has a motion to uh, move as recommended. Uh, Mr. Clark. Question. The only concerns, back to Jacinta, the only concerns were just because of the real property report, nothing from the Jason landowner. No, and I, I mean, I should explain to them that uh, area is part of the subject property adjacent to uh, okay. the Brennan's, but they also have a home on the property. It's just that that is their backyard as well. So, okay, okay well, let's... yeah, it was the real property report that uh, brought this forward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion? Okay, I'll call the question. All those in favor of Mr. Gender's motion? That one's carried. Uh, moving on to 7.2, development permit 22067 with the Buffalo Lake Meadows Owners Association, page 19. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Buffalo Lake Community Association is proposing to install a 20 or 40 foot sea can on a gravel base on the county's municipal reserve parcel, lot 9MR, block 1, plan 0521151. The association is requesting the county provide and plant screening material between the existing fence and the sea camp. The association has indicated they would be responsible for plant watering for the first season. Section 80 of the county's land use bylaw states, notwithstanding the provisions of any land use district, the placement and use of the sea can is as an ancillary building on any parcel of land adjacent to or within a multi lot subdivision, a hamlet, a village, or a small town, or sorry, or a town shall be a discretionary use the Municipal Planning Commission may, in its sole discretion, approve a development permit application for a CCAN on a temporary basis pursuant to Section 25. Section 25 states, when the Development Authority imposes a condition restricting the duration of a development permit pursuant to Section 24.1, the Development Authority shall specify the length of time that the development permit remains in effect, and require that the use be stopped and or any improvements be removed once the development permit expires. Impose a condition that the county is not liable for any cost incurred in removing any improvements at the expiry of the development permit and the development authority may require that the applicant enter into an agreement with the county guaranteeing the removal of any improvements when the use is changed or discontinued. The agreement may require the applicant to post a security guaranteeing the removal of any improvements. 
Upon, a, upon expiry of a development permit issued on a temporary basis, a new application is required. Such application shall be considered as a first application and the development officer is not obliged to approve it on the basis that the previous development permit was issued. That concludes my presentation. Okay. <clears throat> So what is the uh, purpose of the CCAM for storage of So right now, as you can see in the photo, they, this is where they store their boats and their boat trailers. Uh, they have an agreement, they have a license of occupation to do that. Um, what's happened is there's a lot of uh, trailer attachments, boat paddles, boards, different things like that, that have started to accumulate in that parking area, making it pretty cluttered. And there has been some theft up there as well. So what they're looking to do is put a C cam, and then everyone will be responsible to keep all those odds and ends locked securely, securely in the C cam, and kind of clean up the clutter there as well. Okay. Uh, any discussion, Mr. Stevens? Uh, normally, I uh, am not a fan of C cams in urban environments. Um, I do see this as not not really changing the conditions that is a storage area there is out of season there's 30 docks and boat lifts there it's not an urban esque <laughs> look to it so for that reason i'm i'm not as concerned and it is that parking area that mr is heavily screened on all sides so i don't think that this is an eyesore from from any of the uh, proposals. Okay. Mr. Clark? Mr. Chair, I just would like to make the comment that I, we had one come through, I believe it was our last MPC meeting, which we see pictures in this package, uh, to make sure that it is a properly paint, or painted nicely, uh, as, as nice as what a seat can can look, and not one with the multicolors and the multi signs painted on it and everything else. Okay. Any other discussion, Mr. Gender? What's the time limit on this in here? Okay. Or is there an expiry? I never saw any expiry. We are requesting a five year permit for it. And the um, request to plant trees around it, it looks quite heavily treed, but um, do they have to take out some trees to get it in? Or? There will have to be some clearing. There's a fair bit of shrubbery there right now. Some scrub brush there to. To get it in, and then they want more trees planted, or just to kind of screen it a bit more. Some probably some nice shrubs, I guess, from their from their diagram. There looks like they just want to put them just to kind of screen it away behind. So I guess the county does this is approved. The county does have their own trees up in a bit of our own tree farm, I guess. Any other, uh, Mr. Jenner? Oh, in the letter, they're requesting about uh, there was a 20 to 30 cubic meters of material like for to put, put under the base. I find it is excessive for that amount on it. Only see the uh, for the amount of area that they're looking at. I'm not really sure whether we should be uh, supplying the gravel or whether it should be at their expense on it. Okay. Um, thoughts from the board. Mark? Well, typically, you model on three by 12s and a little bit of gravel. That does sound like an awful lot of fill. So, I think maybe we just, if we allow them the space, it's up to them to put an adequate base in and place it. That would be my opinion. And uh, Rich, you've been there. Is there a, much of a slope to that area? It's no, it's pretty, pretty flat where they're looking to. Well, uh, so we shouldn't need more fill at one end, like 10 more fill at one end. I think they can just pull the topsoil off. And Let's grab it and grab it on space. Get it base. Yeah. Okay. Um, Mr. Stevens. Um, I'll uh, support the motion uh, with staff recommendations. And I will add the condition that Larry suggested that uh, they provide uh, pictures to the satisfaction of the development uh, authority. And I will put forward the motion that we approve it. And the base would be on the community association that they're uh, they're based rather than okay. 
Okay. Uh, Marlene, is that motion clear to you? Okay, is it clear to the board? Okay. Any further discussion? No. Mrs. Cassidy? Sorry, Mr. Chairman, just want to be clear. So the, the recommendation is the county will not supply the gravel, but the county will um, provide and plant screening material between the fence and the container? Because that's what they've asked for. That's what I read Mr. Stevens' motion to be with the addition of a photograph to make sure the C can is properly painted. Okay, just wanted to get that clear in the notes. Um, <clears throat> so we supply the basically the just the area. The, just we, the area. We, we, they've we, asked for gravel and they've asked us to provide plant screening material between the fence and the container. So that would be like topsoil, I guess, right? Uh, I think it was, think it was shrubs based on the picture. Okay. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess that would be our discretion. I would, I would suspect that we don't play any of the natural like Saskatoon's is after shrubs would probably be more than sufficient and pretty economical. So no gravel, and we do the the shrubs. Take more. Take care of them. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. That's clear. Then I'll ask the, the question. All those in favor? Now it's carried. Moving on to 8.1, uh, acre concern that Mr. Gender wants to move forward. I was approached by someone that, okay, initially a landowner owned half section subdivided off a half an, an acreage out of it and he sold the land off to someone else and now though there's concerns i'm not really sure whether it's a confrontation between the the larger landowner or the acreage on who's going to be supplying the fence around it to designate okay this is going to be the area so i'm just kind of wondering should we be looking at conditions in the future that in order to keep everyone on site instead of just providing pins on whether we say Someone puts up a fence to say to have some discussion. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. There didn't have to help me here, just something rich, but there is an actual act called the fence. It's not the yeah, where basically you have to share it, share cost or share it on usually on shared boundaries. You have to share the cost. So if you go in and put up a fence and your neighbor won't pay for it, you bill him if he doesn't uh, if he doesn't pay it, then you come to us, I guess, basically, we get a judgment against them, and it goes on their taxes. So eventually they pay. How long has that been in place? Forever. It hasn't worked well in the past. <laughs> a lot of people don't pursue it, right? Green farmers and found and cattle yeah. owners, cattle yeah. guy typically pays for a fence. Yeah. yeah, we, a lot of people don't pursue it, but it is there. It's good move. Yeah, yeah. yeah because... Uh, on a half a fence, one landowner would do the left half and the right, the opposite guy would do the right half and share it. Not always. Okay. So, Mr. McKay. Seeing that, though, uh, you got a green farm on one side and a cattle farm on the other side, the green farmer doesn't need a fence and the cattle farmer does. Does that still apply? Yeah, I think so. The green farmer needs the fence to keep those cows well, out. He does, but he doesn't really care. But it's he's he's pointing the finger at the cattle operator to keep his cattle in, not not out on his property. Yeah, I know. And oftentimes the cattle guy does <laughs> the, do the fence then, but I guess by law it's a, still a 50-50 deal. Yeah, I just I just want to clarify that. But yeah, I'll try and find it. Is, is there standards on what type seal? Is there standard like can it be a four wire fence or like three wire? Yeah. Three. It used to be three, and I don't think it's changed, but I'm trying to find the actual reg or the, the act here. I think, I think we've got smarter cows now or something. <laughs> yeah. So, Mr. Gender, does that answer your question? Or do you, I mean, if that's follow up on the act? Well, that'd be great if she could follow up on it and then let us know, because they've got, got a couple of them that are chomping at it. It'd mm -hmm. be great to build it. No, it's good to have this clear, for sure. Do that. Please. Thank you. Okay. I guess um, if you're satisfied with that. I just have one other question. Sure. If the owner adjacent is the county of Stettler or the um, the 
the uh, Department of Highways, how does that work? Can they, will they pay for half that fence too? It's only. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just a question. How long the roadway? Yeah, I'm not going to have. Is there one or one? So, if you're satisfied, Mr. Gendel, yes. I'll ask you to make a motion to receive for information. Yes, please. Thank you. All in favor of Mr. Gender's motion and carried. <clears throat> Moving on to new business 9.1, a response letter from the Summer Village of White Sands proposed <laughs> subdivision on page 26. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So at the June 22nd uh, Municipal Planning Commission meeting, the commission reviewed a subdivision referral from the Summer Village of White Sands regarding the proposed creation of three parcels for Lot 8, Block 7, Plan 022341. The commission identified the following concerns with the proposed subdivision. Uh, clarification as the legal description on the letter and the diagram were not consistent. Referral notice does not describe their proposed sizes of the lots, and the county has not been made aware of the total number of dwelling units identified within the summer village of White Sands to date. So the Municipal Planning Commission directed administration to forward a request to the summer village for clarification and the missing information. So the letter was uh, submitted to the county in response on June 27th, and it is attached to the memo below. That's the original letter that was forwarded to them, and then the following is the response. So they hit all the uh, points that were raised. They did. They had um, the breakdown of the lots. Uh, the lot of four hundred and eight titled parcels, which doesn't include their MR, of course, and eleven were approved uh, for a second dwelling. And 17 parcels have two RVs in 2021. So the total of their units uh, to date is 436. And the Buffalo Lake IDP has a provision for 505 lots within the uh, Summer Village. Right okay. And then also they provided the size of the lots, which are uh, 0.5 acres. 39 meters wide and 55 meters deep. So three parcels of that size. And then the reason for the discrepancy within the description was they had used an old plan number. So um, that the reason that yeah. well, they're, they're on that. Okay. So when they say 17 parcels with RVs permitted in 2021, do they have RVs non-permitted? Like they just haven't got permits for them. We updated their land use bylaw. So those, uh, there were 17 lots were grandfathered in under the new bylaw. Okay. So when you change as far as the uh, changes, they will have that. They won't have that option going forward after these. Okay. Is there any other comments on this slide? Okay, I guess there are. May, or our request for information has been satisfied, so uh, we need a motion. Accept for information. The clerk moves to accept for information. All in favor? Carried. 9.2, re a referral for Nevis uh, 766 substation rebuild project on page 29. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So Electric is proposing a bid for the alterations to their Nevis substation located on the northwest of 30, 3921 west of the fourth. Preliminary referral data April 27th identified the following upgrades, the replacement of the transformer to 240 uh, kilowatts of the transformer, addition of a new circuit breaker, the replacement of 125 Kilowatts, 144 kilowatts, and 240 circuit breaker, and the expansion of the north boundary of your substation footprint to include an additional uh, 240 kV bay, and the replacement of the east boundary of the substation fence. A subsequent project update identified additional engineering refinements and noise impact assessment. So, one six meter high noise wall was installed. One um, five meter high noise wall and a HVAC unit silencer. 
So the next phase of their project is for to submit their application to Alberta Utilities Commission. So they're looking for our uh, feedback prior to submitting their uh, application as that is part of their requirement. They are notify adjacent landowners if any concerns. So um, does this raise any flags for planning and development? And I see Mr. Fitzgerald. I'll go with you first. Um, an adjacent landowner had made some complaints earlier about the noise that they have made some changes to the substation earlier in the spring and they were concerned with the increased noise. So I think they will be quite happy to see that they're adding some uh, noise barriers to the, to the development. Silence here. Okay. Mr. Green, did you have anything to add on that? Yeah. Mrs. Donovan? I have a question. In their timelines, they say they did extensive public consultation. Was that the only feedback we kind of got from the public? I never heard from any of the residents. This was just the one lady that had uh, called in and made a complaint to Protective Services. And Contact, go to have a contact there. Um, and so, you know, if, if there have been some changes made, and sure enough, they had. And so, her complaint did have some some ground to it. And definitely more noise than what had been coming from there. So, I don't know how much public consultation is. That was the first I'd heard about when the complaint came in. So. That should probably help future complaints, though, if they've addressed that right already. Mr. Stevens. I will give you the motion. <clears throat> do we receive this one for information or do we respond back to that? Yes, if we... you have no concerns, we could just respond that we have no concerns with the or if you have concerns, we can identify those. So. Okay. It'd be a good idea to respond. I'll give you the motion yeah. that we respond that we have no concerns. That way they know we've had time to review it. Further discussion? No, asked all in favor. It's carried. 9.3 County of Painter, referral Painter of the Wind Project. So, yeah, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So that referral was uh, received yesterday, so it was forwarded to you by email. And uh, so the County of Painter is processing the application now for the Paint Earth Wind Project. And we've seen uh, several newsletters from them throughout their application process. So the uh, end result is they're proposing to install 38 wind turbines, an electrical collection system, two towers, and 240 kilovolt collector station. And so they're showing that on the updated map. So the AUC approved the initial project on December the 14th, 2020. The subsequent application for updates to the turbine technology, resulting in a reduction of the number of turbines from 42 to 38, was approved by AUC on June the 30th, 2022. So now the uh, MPC, their County of Painter MPC will be reviewing the application on August the 3rd. So just asking for our uh, if, what is, if we have any concerns, there is one tower uh, as noted in the email, uh, close to the uh, less than one mile from our county boundary. So, any concerns from the Mr. Park? Uh, we did talk about road use in the past and how they access these sites. Is that confirmed that they won't be utilizing our roads to bring any of this stuff in there? Uh, we could put that as a concern. We have received confirmation. We just really got the referral for the dog permit. I, prior to this was just a newsletters from the uh, project coordinator. It, it's located also in the southern part of the county. It's located to the south in the county of Stellar. Uh, well, it is one mile from the county of Settlers eastern borders. But, uh, I'm thinking that would be the map. Uh, yeah, I think so, but I just don't want Okay. That's we got some information on that one before once. Yeah, we're good. Mr. Stevens. I'm not sure if I'm confusing this with a different wind farm project, but do you want me to forward it to him? They're, uh, they're well underway on one. 
put it that way. Is, <laughs> this is an expansion project, so I don't know well, if this. Okay, because if, if this is the one that's on either side of Highway 36, I mean, they've buried utilities, they've built roads, they've done foundations. I think we've got at least three projects on the go in nature with wind. So this. One north of Halbrook, one south of Halbrook, and one over on 36. Not sure which one this one is. Honestly, not the one on 36. I guess I could pull up the email. Is that Joe in there? It should show. So if we get their email, it might there is an email in your package. Yeah. The first uh, attachment is an updated map. So that looks like the north one. Is Larry, if you look at the little tiny map in the corner of the screen, it shows it's it's just south of twelve. So they're expanding right in my area again. Right over to you, Barry. Yeah, super. <laughs> red sky, you know, there's always that saying red sky in the morning, red sky at night, it's red sky period when you look up to the east at home and also. Is it is it possible to request what their end of life reclamation requirements are? Sure. Yeah, I appreciate because it, if they stand there forever, that's gonna be a wonderful cemetery. <laughs> and uh, so the um, I guess it's the six. Which room is it? Seventeen zero or sixteen four? Which is the county divide? It's sixteen four, I think. Sixteen four. So is that? Our road or their road? That'd be their road. That'd be their road because it's yeah. the south and west roads. Right, yeah. So it, they shouldn't be accessing it with any county roads by that. Those, those roads don't go very far south either. They're only two miles or more. Well, we can put that in the recommendation so please don't need county roads to access these. Okay. And if they did, they need a road disagreement. Right. Okay. Is there a way? Okay, so we have those two uh, questions or concerns about road, uh, which road they're accessing from and the end of life plan. Okay. Anything Maybe further? Yeah. There's nothing to add. I guess we can uh, re receive your information with the uh, direction to planning to forward a letter. With great reluctance, I received for information. And forward the letter with our two concerns. Okay. All in favor? And carry. Moving on to old business, 10.1, um, development permit 22051, lot 11, Block four plan E three eighty five for derives page forty two. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, last month's uh, MVP meeting, the local plan commission considered an application for a CCAN within the hamlet of Bata, 
And so the landowner has provided a photo of the Seekin that we're that are proposing to install, and it's on the following page. Oh, well, that's a moment, actually. There it is. Okay. That's what's a new unit. Okay. That was the request for a photo. <laughs> Does it make meet your approval, Mr. Clark? Well, it certainly looks a lot better than a lot of the sea cans that you see. Yeah, no, it, it does. It's uh, Very nice. Yeah. Yeah, also do. Yeah. All righty. So, I guess if there is no concerns. Do we have to, uh, I guess you would have to contact the people and say that there's no concern of addition of the CCAN? Yeah, once he submitted, uh, we were able to issue the permit uh, based on the photo. Oh, because it was, you already knew it. Yes. It was uh, a 21 day appeal period, which lapsed uh, this week. So we were fine to issue it. Okay, no, yeah, it's new conditions. So I guess just receive for information if someone cares to make that motion. Mr. Stevens, all those in favor? That was carried. 10.2 is the Gaffney Master Drainage Plan, page 45. We just, uh, I just hear a speech of that, but we just, they were, so I'll just give you a little bit of the background. An open house was held on March the 8th at the Gatsby Community Hall to present the Gatsby Master Drainage Plan prepared by MPE Engineering to local residents and property owners. The Gatsby Master Drainage Plan has, to, has now been finalized and issued for use. And we've attached a copy. Administration is seeking direction on the next phase of the project. One, was there another public open house required to present the final report? Or should we bring it forward to an upcoming uh, council meeting for adoption? So if the public open house is held, it would likely be in September. And if it's not required, we could bring it forward in August. Speak to the project. Yeah, so if I may, the uh, the previous open house that we did uh, related mostly to the existing condition reports to discuss what was discovered when the survey and the uh, hydraulic analysis was done and present a few plans for discussion. The feedback that came out of that meeting went into the final uh, the plan as well as we did a flood response plan as well uh, which outlines some of the you know should there be one there uh, sort of an additional report on top of your standard uh, uh, what do you call it uh, master drainage plan to provide some guidance on if there is flooding in the area how best to handle it without doing a whole bunch of extra survey work so it's already sort of all laid out is what needs to happen. So obviously the big question is, do we need to go back for a final presentation of it to the public or is a council meeting adopting the plan adequate at this point? So just looking for some direction. Yes. Area council. Yeah, area council and local landowner that sees most of the water that goes through Gatsby. Mm -hmm. I see that that berm on the west side is shown as optional. If it is shown, if there's thoughts at all about that berm, it has to go back to another open house. Because that that living there, growing up there for longer than anybody else that was at that meeting, that water needs to go the direction I said, because that's the way it's always went. It will overland flood a pile of land if we leave it the other way and try to force it over to the east side. So um, I've talked to some other other landowners and and people in town, and no one left me another meeting because that was assumed after that discussion that we were looking at drainage from both sides. Yeah, and that's why they moved it to optional. They they still believe it's the right thing to do. They leave it up they to live, the, they don't live there, Rick. They, they did the work, and they'll leave it up you're, to the. You're going to flood a bunch of farmland and a bunch of that acre, the acreages to the. Nobody is building a berm. They've okay. given it as an option. If the county decides to do capital work out there, that's an option to consider. That's exactly what they're asking for, is consideration of it. So if there's detailed design happening, chances are the next guy that goes out there will suggest the same thing because they found it as well. That said, nothing is getting done without approval of a capital plan 
to make it happen. So that discussion happens later. You know, we did have a final open house uh, planned in the budget for this thing. It just comes down to that question. Do you still see that necessary to happen or do you want to go straight to a adoption of the plan? I guess you heard my opinion on it. So just for clarification, the option is in the engineer's report for a burn, but um, at this time it's not being considered. But it, at such a time it is being would be considered, or if it is considered at that time, it would it go back to public consultation before it was installed, or nobody is installing a burn at this point. But I mean, down have a professional responsibility to provide good information. Their hydrology says that's the way to go. That's what they're stamping in the way of reports. They're leaving it as optional for the county to decide. So, no, there's no berm unless council decides they want to see a berm. Okay. Mr. Mr. Santos is fairly short legged, so if we actually had our five and a half or six inches of rain, he couldn't probably walk a few across a few of those spots if there was a berm in place. So that uh, I I'm sorry about his hydrologist report, but living there riding horses through there riding bikes through there it in the water that was designed that way 30 years ago to take water and i think those people had a, a good reason to put the culvert system and everything in that they had so that's i voice that opinion to mr and but it, it is it is a natural way for that water you'll flood everything if we don't if we go the other way okay well Yes, at this time there's no plan for a burn. Yeah. When I see it in a, in a proposal, it bothers me when I see it proposed because we're an optional. But I mean, Mr. Chairman, why don't we um, why don't we take it to public consultation, bring the final report back, um, have MP come out, do a presentation, and uh, if at that time they amend the plan to totally take out the berm, that would be fine too. Why don't we look at doing something like that in the fall when people would be available? Or if it's a council decision, when is the work going to get done? Like that's the other part is is uh, if if it's a council decision, and we but if but if it's if that burn is to win, that is a different discussion. Well, the problem I've got, and I'll be honest with you, is I've got grants pending on the uh, on Gatsby. I've got to spend them. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd let I I just basically got an extension the other day. December 31st, 2023. So if we were to do anything to facilitate this plan, it would have to be in the next two years if we wanted to use that money. And honestly, you know, right now this is a uh, master plan. There are no projects proposed. There is no budget allocated to it or approved projects. Um, so what comes out of a detailed design later other than the maintenance work suggested, that still has to be a, an approved project. Okay, Mr. Stevens. Uh, two questions. One was during the uh, public consultation that took place, how well attended was it? Was there quite a few people that uh, probably about a third of the households were third to that? represent it? A, a third of the households is probably higher than I anticipate for public consultation, to be honest with you. Uh, Second question is, you said there's grant money available, and when you go to their optional pricing estimates, what are we talking, do we have enough grant money to do what being suggested, or is we good? We could? Depends how we prioritize what's left to be done. Um, is there other, other, Tasks that should be in the queue for that grant money as well. Yeah, we've got some roadways to repair. We've got some sewer hookups that have to be done. We have uh, water that has to be moved so that we don't have two areas you can get water, just one, you know, things like that. But there's quite a bit of grant money sitting there. It is that transitional grant, so it has to be spent there. Yeah, yeah no, I understand that. I just think if we had to do work on the lagoon, or I just don't want to. Yeah, I'm working on that too. <laughs> a lot of a lot of this early in conversation took place before I got here, so I'm just trying to get caught up. So, Yvette, um, 
the transitional grant, does it cover the full cost of each project or is it a portion? No, no but we we're piggybacking the leftover MSI grant that they had and plus the federal gas tax or the Canada Building Fund. Yeah, yeah. Community, whatever the name of that thing is now. Yeah. Um, but you put that all together, it's a substantial amount of money that has to be spent. Even the MSI has to be spent before we move over to the local charter program or it just becomes such a, uh, a nightmare to try to uh, navigate to different programs, right? Well, it's going to be no trouble because there's lots of projects there that need attention. So. Right. And so um, when we do the Baja Lagoon this fall or even the end of August, towards the end of August, hoping to be able to kind of tender it together and then just move the crew over and do the Gatsby one at the same time. Yeah, so uh, that's what we're working towards right now. It's all been surveyed. Uh, from what I understand, at least both has been done. I'm, I guess we should have been done by now or awfully close. So yeah, trying to coordinate that, but be very conscious that we have this amount of money. It's for the betterment of the community of Gatsby, so we need to get it spent. So if council feels that the uh, residents of Gatsby deserve another shot at this thing, then let's give it to them. I'm fine with that. Right. Residents in Gads, we just don't want water to back up. Yeah. Um, I'm talking from one of the landowners, the affected landowners, and how that water will have to go. It will back up, probably not within Gadsby, but on every landowner to the south, and then it could run into Gadsby. And that's what it's did in the past. So before they put those other drainage ditches in. So the method that they had before allowed drainage from both sides of the village into the one common uh ditch system that runs into my property. So it, it's, it is a, it has, a, it, 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 we, we've had, it was very successful when they did the first project. There's a reason they did the first project. And it's really a cleanup of what was there in order to get that water flowing again, it, it worked. So that's, I guess, where my. So uh, we could take it back to public consultation record. Do you think we could just ask MPE to amend the, the plan? Well, I don't think there's anything to amend, actually. The, the primary part of the work is cleaning up the existing infrastructure that was in place. Um, personally, I think it'd be irresponsible to not suggest an alternative if there's one there that they believe will work. That said, the, the concepts are fairly simple here. They have seen the issues and they have been addressed. Largely, the berm was addressed by removing it as an optional. So if you see something down the road you don't like, you tell them not to design it that way. It's pretty simple. Um, but it is it is one of those things that the bulk of the work is cleanup of the existing infrastructure, getting working right, realigning if need be. Yeah. Um, My concern is I just don't want to, I don't want this to get lost in transition. And unfortunately with you leaving me, um, there's that, always that risk. So I want the plan to be very clear. And um, so if I get hit by a truck, um, that what works for Gatsby is there in black and white. If it, if you prefer, I can simply phone them to say, send another piece out and remove that comment that it's optional. Okay. Um, we do have budget if you want to take it back to the public. Uh, that was part of the original scope of work uh, to show them what the final plan looks like, yeah. um, which is generally a good idea. So I, don't, I wouldn't argue that one at all. Um, that said, it's like I said, it's Things are pretty much where they need to be. They just need to be cleaned out and reset. Things have sloughed in and culverts have filled in and things like that. There just needs to be a bunch of maintenance work, large. Yeah. Well, I, I personally, just because of the changes that we've got going on, uh, would like it amended so that it's clear. It's in black and white. And coming from my river, you don't mess with Mother Nature. You don't mess with people that have lived there for hundred years because they know what happens in that community better than anything. So I would say that we, we get the plan amended and then if we want, we can go back out with the final and do a public consultation in the fall. You're not going to get anybody in the summertime, but you will. And you're just presenting the final plan in its final form. What they saw before was the concepts of what they saw and discussed a bunch of solutions. So it is appropriate to take it back. To them for sure. yeah. And if we get it amended, then it also shows we're listening, right? So, yeah. okay. Uh, one last question. When we're talking about drainage and backing up on private land and which direction it should go and that sort of thing, is there any concerns about uh, we need cables on land? Is that in place? Was that part of the study? That, that may be. Um, 
if this plan gets you know the council approves the plan when we get it amended probably not a bad idea if, if one landowner could really be affected right like the region <laughs> <laughs> That's I, just, I just want my opinion listened to. Yeah. Being, being the oldest person that lived in the area. I didn't think I didn't mean you were out there for a hundred years. Close. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Something we sh we should we should look at. Um, uh, it's funny. I actually had this conversation with Annika this morning over the Baltha subdivision. Right. Um, Alberta Environments come back now, basically looking to approve, but wants no basements on that area that would have to be caveated on the property right so that if they sell it then that next buyer is well aware that he can't put a basement on that site right and i think that uh, you know in the past not just us but everybody's been very deficient in that and the caveats haven't been put on the title and then somebody buys it and just expects to do whatever they wish but sometimes there's just rules that they can't just like an Erskine, you know, we've got the same thing in Erskine. You, you may not have been there a hundred years, but one generation back in your family, yeah, you're not far off <laughs> where the swimming holes were and everything else. So, well, I've, I've got pictures of my father in law swimming across the street. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah things change. So. If, if that's what the CEO Dasty suggested that will be happening, I would make a motion to that. To do the amendment and to bring it to public consultation. The final product, the right. final draft. Okay, um, Mr. Clark has moved that. All those in favor? It's carried. It's the 11.1 um, the in camera session. Is that going to be a short one? The, do you want to wait to do that? After the two o'clock, is the two o'clock delegation by Zoom or in person? In person. In person, are they here? Okay. I think the chair was making up for lost time based on ASB. Yeah. He is breathing right <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. He wants to get all the way to the is, there, is there anyone watching the meeting? Is there any? Do we have members? Nobody from. Okay. It's just uh, a lot of discussion today, most of them, except Gatsby. <laughs> Larry's making a meeting at once. Okay. Can we take a short time for time? Okay, we'll just do a break then for a um, no, 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 comfort break.
from the Buffalo Lake Owners Association. And uh, we will uh, start this portion with our introductions once again. And this time we'll start with uh, Marlene and we'll come around this way. Marlene. Is that Cassidy, CAO? Bernie Gidner, your board member. Good afternoon. Paul oh, McKay, okay, board member. Larry Clark, board member. Justin Stevens, hello. Russ Dober, vice chairman. Thank you, Dorsonson, director of communications. Jacinta Donovan, director of dining services. Derek Kushner, manager of IT. Michelle Luber, legislative assistant. Rich Fitzgerald, development officer. Uh, Bruce Olson, the president of the Buffalo Lake Meadows Owners Association. And I've got John Zacharak here. He's a, a, a resident there, and he's going to uh, talk at the end as well. Okay, and then in the back, Rick Green, director of operations. Okay. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. If you would go ahead and give your presentation. Great. Um, we were asked to come here to, to sort of talk about some of the, the issues that we've seen going on in the uh, uh, in the community of Buffalo Lake Meadows. Um, Certain things trigger, and, and we're a fairly active association with uh, with our membership, uh, having what we think is a very good re relationship with the county, and and uh, we've worked really well together in the past and uh, throughout the years. And uh, association has had no complaints in the sense of the county, other than like the normal stuff about taxes and everything else that people complain about, but. Um, wanted to just sort of put it in perspective and what we are doing um it's related to the to the uh uh approach authorizations and and we've seen it in the last little while and we've had uh, some discussions at the lake about uh, with uh, other owners and the concerns been raised over the land owners and the, the way the wording is in the policy about uh you know what's required when you pull a development permit, um, the way the wording is in the policy, uh, uh, the Public Works 2.6, is that uh, any approach uh, that was previously installed uh, to the county standards uh, by one developer, if another developer uh, subsequently uh, pulls the permit um, and wants to use the same access, which is, is what has happened in almost every case at uh, Buffalo Lake Meadows, um, they must report or they must uh, potentially uh, pull a, uh, an approach application. So that sort of obviously raised some questions. Um, I pulled the, the relevant sections out of the, out of the policy and um, basically it says it, it, there, there's no real wiggle room in it at all. It says if you are the new developer, which the landowner would be, um, you you must apply for an approach permit and it has to meet the new standard. That, that's basically what it says. So when we look at sort of the development and on, on the second page there, um, Buffalo Lake Meadows is not flat. It, it rises from the lake to quite a height um, at the very back of the, sub, uh, the subdivision. So in the one close that we have, there's not even uh, at the, the picture that's there on page two, um, we don't even have culverts or ditches because it's the high point at the subdivision. So from that perspective, when if somebody, the, the concern is somebody's going to add a garage, uh, do some work on the land, and now they have to meet because when people hear of what's been happening, they say, well, that means I'm going to have to do this and I'm going to have to do that. Um, the standard itself um, is quite prescriptive in the sense of, you know, the diagrams are there exactly what you got to apply, how it has to work. Um, one, of the, one of the requirements is that it slope, the approach has to slope towards uh, or away from the roadway, sort of after the uh, at at the uh, design stage of the, the approach. On the page three, there we've highlighted. It's a map of the subdivision, and we've highlighted all the lots where that doesn't happen uh, currently. Um, and the con the concern that we have is that 
obviously when the, when the subdivision was developed and it was what we consider one of the premier kind of subdivisions in the area uh, roads are good um, approaches are good the, nice and wide most of the side slopes are great all of the, the the whole subdivision is was done very very well and now you know we could have this this problem of of having each an individual lot owner have to redo the approach in front of their lot. Um, so that creates a whole other problem in the sense of how that's going to affect lots surrounding it. Um, there is also concern with the fact that um, we, we all know that if you build a, uh, you say you're building or adding on to your cabin, you have to uh, once you get past a certain point, you have to meet today's standard for, say, electrical code. Well, that's property you own. That's property you own, you use, you develop. The the right of way and the approach is owned by the county. We the, the lot owners don't own that property. We don't control it. We don't, you know, we maintain it in the sense of access. But it was and it was also uh, when the subdivision was developed. It obviously met the standard of the day because the subdivision was approved. Um, our biggest concern is, well, are we seeing something because of the of the approach requirements? Are we seeing something that's, okay, this is a bigger picture issue that we need to have some improvements in the entire subdivision? Uh, quite frankly, we've never had drainage issues. Um, it, the majority of the land up there is sand. You, you can't pour a bucket on the ground and, and have a puddle. It just doesn't happen. So we've, we, we have never seen any drainage issues whatsoever. And the concern is that it's going to become a, a standard that says, oh, you have to apply. Um, as soon as that happens, then all of a sudden, you, we already hear the conversation. Well, if I have to do that, I'm not going to apply. Compliance is a, this is a very big deal for us because we want people in the neighborhood to comply and for the county obviously you want to know what's going on you you don't want them to not get a development permit when they really should all of these things kind of tag on to that and then when there's sensitivity about increased taxes lower services and now you know we have heard the rumblings of saying well this is just another way to get improvements done on land that we don't own, that the county owns, controls, and get us to pay for it. So if there is a global issue within the subdivision, our concern is, well, okay, who's responsible for that in, in the sense if there is a drainage issue, if there is a problem. So what we've done is we, we looked at the policy, said, um, here's some maybe some su suggested changes to the policy that could make it a little more um, clear for, for those that are um, facing this, this this issue. And essentially, section four is the, the section that deals with that, saying when existing approach was previously installed to the county standards by one developer and another developer desires to use the same approach by adding just something in there that says, and there's you know a documented problem where there is a problem with that approach, related to that approach. That would clarify and say, well, if there's no problem, I'm not going to have to do that. So there's some comfort there in that sense. So um, that way, people that are comfortable with the approach and know that we haven't had any issues with it are, are going to be fine with it. And then related to that, and there is no, uh, there also is no sort of way out or, or well, a way to sort of make your case and say, well, I, I don't agree. I think this is going to work. So um, section seven deals with that and uh, the saying that they currently, it says it has to be to this design standard, period. There is no flexibility. And then, so by adding to the end of that little paragraph saying, or the developer must prove to the satisfaction of the director of instruction operations, that the proposed um, differing design will adequately perform the functions. So in areas where right now, for example, and John's gonna show some pictures uh, when I'm done of the area and where, where the sort of non-compliance uh, issues would show up. Um, 
when you look at that and you see it and saying, you know, we're not, uh, to meet the design standard, you have to have a culvert, you have to meet the side slopes and the ditches and everything else. Um, there, there, are, there are places in the subdivision where that just is not physically possible because of the topography. Um, it was designed that way from the beginning. Uh, we live in an acre subdivision in Red Deer. We're on the high side of it. We don't even have a culvert uh, because there's no side slopes. 20 feet away, we've got a probably one to one ditch. So, you know, from that perspective, you know, it didn't make sense to have the culvert uh, in some places because the topography just doesn't lend itself to do that. So what I want to do is just turn it quickly over to John. He'll give you his perspective and sort of quickly go through some pictures of the area. Um, we're just hoping that, you know, you would, we were asked to see if that uh, MPC would suggest to take it to administration to, you know, maybe pose some changes to the bylaw or to the policy to make that a little bit more uh, clear for those that are having to interact and deal with that particular policy now. So I'll turn it over to John. Yeah, um, again, my name is John Zacharick. I, I just wanna thank you for having the opportunity to talk today. I know I've, I've, I've seen you've had to Larry and Justin and uh, various members come out to our AGM. We are very appreciative, uh, appreciative of that. And we really appreciate the, the open relationship that we've had over the years and the ability to talk and work things out. And I'm hoping this is uh, going to be a continuation of that. So that picture you're seeing right now that's up on the screen is from my deck this morning. It is a beautiful day in the county. You are welcome to come anytime you would like to come check it out. I will have a beverage for you of your choice. I might even do some barbecue for you, but I, you're always welcome is what I'm trying to say. Anyway, we are the highest point in the subdivision and uh, what got me interested in this was a neighbor was applying for a development permit on his land and it triggered this approach permit. And I question, I sent an email to Jacinta saying, if I put in a development permit on this lot with this beautiful cabin to put in a garage, is there the possibility that it could trigger me upgrading my approach? And she said it might. And so then I started to ask questions as to, was it even possible to do it because of the slope the topography of the ditch. Um, obviously, there's utilities buried in the right of way and so on, given that the current county standard is very clear. It seemed to me that it was written for maybe like an adjacent piece of land that is lower than the road, and it would be easy to meet the slope requirements on this standard number six. But one thing that I was really interested in was already on standard number six, there is no four that says the county may at its, its discretion um, provide some variance to this approach standard. So that's what I'm hoping today that we can have uh, a mechanism where we can look at these, these cases and maybe provide an exception that, that can grandfather in something that may be uh, a little more onerous than just building a crossing across a ditch to a piece of land and require significant earthworks, moving of utilities, or making the hill unusable to be able to drive up. So this picture from my deck, my my house, my cabin is is about 70 or 80 feet above the cul-de-sac we're talking about, which is also the high point in the community. So looking down from my deck, that's the top of my entrance road as as it comes up from that cul-de-sac. And then this is the road that, that enters in. At that end of the cul-de-sac, there's no ditch, there's no culverts. It's basically a ramp going up my hill to, uh, to, to the top. And so where you can see the fence there, it might be a little hard because it's dark. That's the end of our lot. So that's the end of the right-of-way and the utilities are within that right-of-way in the edge of the cul-de-sac. That is the part that in your standard number six says from the edge of the roadway to the, to the edge of the right-of-way, that approach needs to slope down in a way at a one to two percent grade and i don't know how i i personally could possibly build that and be able to then get up the hill and then yeah okay on our diagrams here like which lot are you stating that there is this uh on on the the lot diagrams there's you'll see a cul-de-sac and uh, my two lots are five and seven and these two ditches that you're seeing, or two ditches, these two roads that you're seeing, the, the road on the left is lot seven, and the road on the right is lot five. Thank you. I'll just pause to you guys if you've got a chance to look and figure out what I'm talking about. 
then your host right. Selling, there's a five and seven on Hill Close. Yeah, Hill Close, Hill Close, sorry, yeah, cul de sac on Hill Close, maybe it wasn't clear. Your house is on lot seven then? That house is on lot seven, and then I own lot uh, five as well, and there's a garage, existing garage on that, that property. So my conversation with Jacinta is we're, we're talking about putting a garage on lot seven, we're talking about putting a primary residence on lot five. Would this trigger redevelopment of the approach? And it may. And if it did, the current county standard is such that I don't think I could build it. And I don't know how this would Im impact my my ability to access the road. Like it's more like I said, it's it's very it's quite a bit of significant earthwork required to do this. If we had to take the hill down, re-engineer the road to meet the standards of you know 90 degrees to the approach, the ditch has to be so many uh, like what is it 0.8 of a meter from the bottom of the ditch to the top of the approach, and so on. And then to have those and negative slopes. Gonna, there are also pie locks there, so they're super narrow at the front. So even to do the earthwork, so you can angle up the hill to be able to do that as long as I don't think they're going to do it. Yeah, like that that fence, the lot the lot lines are going out from from that fence. So they're also going in as it enters the cul-de-sac. Um I just drove around this morning too. Um it was a great day. I wore my helmet is the well, is the peace officer in here. Okay good. Just making sure. Um and I just took some more pictures and these are some of the lots on that same diagram that are, are the second row back from the lake. And it's, it's, we have the same situation again. You've got the municipal right of way, which goes uh, up to the lot entrances and all the utilities are buried in there. Some of these entrances meet the standard, most of them don't. And again, I just went and randomly took pictures on here, whether it's for width, slope, culvert, And again, I'm just flipping through. These are just a bunch of pictures here of, of uh, approaches again that are all uh, incorrect slope, incorrect width. But completely functional. But completely functional, yeah. So, I mean, they've been here since, like, I, I bought in 2007. And uh, this has been the way it's been for the last 17, what's that, 16 years, 15 years. So this is coming back towards uh, the hill close. You can see it at the very end there. And you can see how even just the hill close is the high point in the back end of the community. And then my roads come off of this. And uh, again, I just wanted to reiterate, I, I believe that if this standard doesn't have a little wiggle room for us to work with Rick and Jacinta to, to, uh, to do what um, is probably the best for the community, we're kind of opening up a big can of worms trying to figure out how to uh, fix a lot of problems in the neighborhood and to put it onto one lot owner is uh, a bit onerous so i guess I, uh, my last question would be um if this is an issue in the county we just wanted to have that dialogue to say what what are we what issue are we addressing by by fixing the culverts? Okay. So this picture here that's looking at your cold sack when you're done is your property that's correct yeah, you can see the, the pole there. You can see um, the, yeah, this picture is basically facing south right now. And uh, I'm in the back corner facing uh, Hankins quarter section. And then the provincial park is to the east there behind us. Yeah. So you said that you bought in 2007? Uh, yeah, 2000, January 2007. The, the cabin that we own now, we bought uh, just a few years ago, but that was developed in 2006. And so like, I'm just kind of wondering. What year this development was built? 2005, I believe. Yeah, it was approved in 2005. Like, so I'll just make the statement that I was actually the contractor that built the location, built the thing in there. And I'm very much aware of, say, like with, with all the roads that were in there, the color placings and everything. And like what really baffled me in there when I was building is the, the upward slope that you have built your home on. I guess I was questioning how the hell is anyone ever going to build it? If we be able to go up there. So I see the problem right now being okay with what you're stating. And if we make that cul de sac even build a flow off of itself into a ditch area and then uh, an away slope, say, like with the approaches into your property, we would you would have to destroy an awful lot of your vegetation in there to build and accomplish any roadway up in there. I, I, so I, I definitely do see what your problem is. In there, there was so damn much sand that we had to 
dig a hole, if you go in back to the west of you, that we had to dig a hole deep enough to bury a buggy in order to get some proper clay out, in order to cap those roads to make them drivable. Because in there, if you drove over, you could not drive around in there with a two wheel drive truck. You had to put a four wheel drive. So I'm very much aware of the conditions that are in there and the amount, of, the type of soil that is in there. And, and no matter if you got six inches of rain, it would be gone within a couple hours. It would be soaked in. So I'm very much aware of, see, like the situation here, and I'm very much aware of your of your concerns. Right. Does uh, administration have any? Thing to add to this at this point, uh, Rick or anyone, or Mr. Stevens. Thank you. Um, for I guess I, I think you were portraying the worst case scenario uh, when you're talking about regrading some of these access ways, and I believe that our intent is the same as yours. If, you're, if your house is 70 feet high, we're not going to make you contour this way just to go off 80 feet instead of 70. I don't think anyone's intent is that. And I don't think that would really, when we're talking about removing vegetation, wholesale regrading, I don't even think that's compliant with our IDP that we're supposed to match natural topography and that, and that sort of thing. I don't think that would really make sense. Uh, in the note, I believe it was note four that you referenced uh, about allowing uh, the development authority some discretion. And just looking at your proposed change here on the back page, point number seven, um, I think your wording and our wording isn't that much different. Note four builds in some allowance for, in this instance, the development authority or Rick Green to, to have some discretionary powers. Your, your proposed wording on point seven isn't that much different than ours. It's the developer must prove to the satisfaction of the director of infrastructure and operations that the proposed differing design will adequately perform the function. That's, in my opinion, that's, I, I'm not opposed to that change. I think it, it is the same thing, just worded differently. I think the intent of both is the same. If I can comment on, on that part of it, uh, part of the discussion and the reason we're here and we're concerned about it was the fact that the wording Note four says that, but then at the very the paragraph at the very end says, then the de the, the developer shall apply. If, when you read that, that's that doesn't give you an option to apply or not. You it, it means you have to apply. You, you have to apply. And that starts the conversation. And correct me if I'm wrong, administration, but there has to be a trigger to start this conversation, whether it's an initial subdivision a garage build, a house build, any sort of development. We don't make farmers put in random approaches hoping a subdivision will arrive. Something has to trigger this, and that has to be an application. At that point, our staff can see if there's a more logical approach, if there should be discretion at that point. And so you have to apply as part of your development process, but as I understand it, just because you have to apply doesn't mean they're going to make you regrade your entire law. And I would think um, when a development permit is taken out, that gives our, our staff goes out and does inspect everything, you know, the access and everything. And if the access is uh, lacking or, I mean, is screen too much for safety and or isn't got a culvert in it when it really should have, it'll be caught at that time. But if it, if it is fine, I, we've approved lots of uh, uh, development permits where the, the access was totally fine, didn't have to be changed. Some do, some don't, but most of them are approved as is. But just because you're taking out another development permit doesn't necessarily mean you have to rebuild your approach. And uh, again, administration can add to that. Yeah. 
Rick and just then to go ahead, Rick first. I can fill in a fair bit of that if you like. So when there's a change of use, um, that's sort of the trigger one way or the other. Is it appropriate for the new use? So if you're dragging a trailer up there once or twice a year on one of these lots, and that's all you're doing, you're not developing infrastructure, you're not building a house, digging basements, doing a full lock grading plan, which is what's required. Uh, if you're going to do any earthworks on a lot, uh, plus the approach application, that'd be a bit of a different thing. We don't, the developers don't, of the subdivision, don't build driveways for the houses because they have no idea what's getting laid out down the road. We've got a subdivision in Erskine. We didn't build the driveways. Buffalo View Estates, we didn't build the driveways. There are access points that were roughed in in the, every case. Um, so to that end, the change of use is what triggers this, and it happens all over the county, not just in lake subdivisions. It happens for subdivisions for farmers and acreage owners alike everywhere. The issue that I found with the standards is that when they were done, and this is predating myself from what I understand because they were here when I got here, is there was no thought that there was anything else. I think like they said that basically you have a flat world out here and everything happens down away from the road. In these situations, runoff coming down the driveway straight down to the shoulder of the road or the cul-de-sac is going to create wet, weak, muddy spots over time, increased maintenance. The general philosophy of the approach standard is that it is crowned and shaped to go into a ditch and not onto the road. So that's why it would go away and then up and then ground away. It doesn't happen much. So when we're doing our inspections, uh, we're taking a look at the standards, we're taking a look at constructability. I haven't found one yet that would cause me any grief building it. Um, got to move a occasional tellus line here and there or lower a gas line. That's all pretty easy stuff. But the maintenance side of that is a reason for it. And the other part of it is it doesn't look like anybody considered these environments when the standards were made, largely the lake subdivisions. We had a very similar situation in Buffalo View Estates many years ago. Um, we had to go to curb and gutter, if some of you remember that, based on how things were working, just to get drainage working and the fact that the subdivision wasn't built as it was designed. Natural topography, you're always going to have these issues. It's common all over the place. The question is, do the standards need to be updated to reflect all the environments that we work in, give us some flexibility or not? I apply the standard because I don't see a problem building it. I wouldn't shy away from it at all. I usually will lower a bit of cover over the pipe, lower the size of the pipe a little bit if need be, and make small adjustments. But I understand having maintained roads all over this county, that those spots where all the runoff comes down onto the shoulder create large problems throughout. And I think that's largely the, the crux of the issue of why it is what it is. But I also think the opportunity was missed back when the standards were done to account for all of our environments, if that makes any sense. You could actually narrow up that cul-de-sac and achieve part of what you're after instead of jumping up onto the lots. Lots of different things to do, but the change of use, the construction on the lot is what's triggering this. And in a lot of cases, things were done wrong or without permits in the past. And that's largely what you see throughout the county is things just roughed in and nobody noticed it. And that's what's there today. Does that help frame it up at all for you? So, so, so my 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 question, Rick and I, Rick and I, um, uh, what I would agree is good dialogue. Like it's been cordial back and forth. Um, it's just how does one lot owner doing a development permit address this? If the whole, like, let's say that whole cul-de-sac is improperly engineered, how does one person, when they pull a development permit, do they take on the whole? Uh, repair to make it compliant? Do they just do the 20 feet of their frontage and now you've got like a a, a dug in ditch with culverts in only one section and then there's no problem. Like it, it seems to me that if, if we're going to address the maintenance issue, it's uh, either either we accept that this is okay and we don't touch it, which is what I would like to do, or we fix it, right? And we do it for everybody. It just and we can see we can see it in in the case that we're dealing with because this is what we know. Um, like Rick was saying, in the sense of this could happen, it has. We have, have I guess I should ask Rick, have you had some serious maintenance issues in the cul in the cul de sac we're talking about? I don't remember any. I don't remember any issue that has come up that says 
because these were built is the age old question of if it met the standard of the day, why do you have to change it unless there's a problem? We haven't seen any problems in the entire subdivision with surface treatment ever. And I don't know, Rick can comment on that. Yeah, no, generally we don't get a lot of service requests from you guys up there at all, which is quite peaceful compared to some of the subdivisions. However, the the fixes can all be there. There's lots of different ways to tackle something like this. I'm still of the opinion that the standards that we have don't reflect all the environments that we have, and that's probably where we need to look. If the lots and grading on natural topography is a challenge, regardless, if you want to keep the hills and the views, you got to get up to the stuff. I mean, you look all over the mountains, I mean, driveways are like that all over the place. Easy fix in this environment, if you wanted to, would be raise a cul-de-sac, narrow it up a little bit, and get things working so you don't end up with the runoff coming onto the road. When you change the use and you start building more houses and bringing more traffic in, that's when the problems will start arising in the lake environment. Usually everything's all melted and dry by the time these people are going up here to enjoy their cabins in the first place. So we don't have all the problems that are created in the spring and all the other environments we work in where these driveways coming straight down to the shoulder are an issue. So my suggestion would be maybe it is time to take a look at the overall standards. Um, that said though, none of this that I see up there scares me away from building it myself either. So I could take it either way. It's just a matter of you, you would have to make some decisions on how you want to go forward. When you say building it yourself, like if you were the owner and having to change it, is that what you're referencing when you say yeah. building? I've, I've seen driveways that look like they're, you know, 15 to 20 percent steep, and to me that's unmanageable. Um, and with the amount of room in some of these lots to pull back farther and maybe do some work up through the slopes to reduce the grade, that's how I do it. But I'm not the one who's got to live on it. So. Or pay for it. That's right. So that's the other side. And you got to remember, this is your land your infrastructure and it's an improvement that you're asking the landowner to make on, on the land we don't so if i can just comment back on that though you're not treated anybody any differently than any other landowner in the county on that so just yeah. back away from that point is if i want to put an approach in it might have to put an application i have to pay either do it to their standard or i have to pay a deposit if i do that to make sure it is to their standard so so that piece is there as we compare it to other subdivisions at the lake, with that very steep slope, vegetation, everything's in place here. We've driven through other ones, and where you have erosion, you have things washing out. So a lot of times your rules apply to everybody. So as the customer member Stevens had said, um, you know this has to be looked at on a on an application per basis, and I, and I don't think we can part blanket anything because that's what's happened throughout the county is we, we end up getting ourselves in trouble by and you say one person can do it and one per pretty soon a lot of the developers up there also too just don't even put an application and just do something so that has to stop so that you know what's there if you have to maintain it it is on our property it is our liability also from all of us as ratepayers just a point about that though any approach that i have onto my land i have to do the same things we do Right, and, but on the in the same vein that we already had an approach that was already there, you know the the you know you're talking about uh, that's the situation we're talking. About. Not no, not, we not a brand new. If we put a development permit in, we could be in the same situation as you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So that's it's it's not different. So that's just it's just smaller parcels is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Grover, did you have a comment? I don't even have to put in a development permit. Oh, I'm Dave Grover. I'm a board member. I've been listening to all this on the, on my phone through Zoom, and uh, yeah, we do. I didn't. I don't own the right. I don't own uh, road lawns there either. But it was before Rick's time. That's how long ago it was. I didn't think that thing would ever run a drop of water. Yeah, it run a little bit, but I I had to. They come out. They inspected it. They told me I built it but they told me exactly how to build it. And I think you have to have a standard like that. You can't just, if you, you said there, oh, well, you should basically, you should just go ahead and build it. I don't know. I didn't know much about building uh, approaches. I know about farming and I, 
know about council that uh, I'm not really a, a road builder. So then I asked our public works foreman. He told me how to well, how to compact it, how long the culvert sticks out of the thing, and how much cover you had to put on it. Maybe it isn't hardly any cover. I don't know. I don't think uh, at this table. Maybe there's a couple learning worked in construction before, but I I I wasn't that way. That thing hasn't run much water. Probably didn't need it, but that was a county standard on the county road. They asked me to do it. I just did it. I enjoyed using having an approach into that field too. So I I don't think we should change the uh, policy just for a few people. Go ahead, Wes. Yeah. And uh, to Santa, did you have some comments? No, I was just probably the previous picture that was up on the screen. That's what triggered the conversation today. We had an application uh, for, uh, well, an RV at this point. And uh, so they were asked to uh, improve their approach. The original approach had been put in when the subdivision was uh, approved back in 2005 and it hadn't been used, so it was overgrown. And so this uh, started the conversation on our approach standards and there's different standards for different environments as we has mentioned. Um, to that end, you said improvements were required that during this application. So they cleaned up some of the vegetation, that sort of thing. What other improvements did we make them do in, in this instance, the one that triggered this conversation? Uh, Rick, could you probably go through the, what was the, the slope? The one up on the corner. This is your driveway. Yeah. This yeah. is your driveway. That's my driveway, yeah. but the, the lot they're talking about is right across, it's number one on that cold sack hill close plan. Yeah. So on, no. This is the yeah. I'm sure it was your yeah. Yeah. So, so if I may, what happens on that lot right now is the driveway comes in on a steep angle into the corner of the uh, intersection of the cul-de-sac. So I wanted them to square it up and move it back a little bit farther from the corner. Get the grades correct, put the correct culvert in, and make sure they've stripped things and built it correctly. Yeah. It was coming in right on the corner. Um, preference would be to get it away from the corner. We same type of thing in all of our environments. We want to see some separation from corners where there could be conflicts. Once again, this environment, low speed. You know, it is a lake environment rather than a urban subdivision in town. Uh, same logic generally applies when you're making comments on things, and that's where our standards are working. Drainage wise, uh, if we're having stuff come straight down onto the road, um, this isn't a paved subdivision with curb and gutter, but the preference would go to that type of a finish if that's how we're going to build things. Because then we can take the drainage onto the carriageway, move it through curb and gutter down to outlets into ditches, one out somewhere else. Um, that just highlights the maintenance issue with some of this stuff. I've also asked them to cut the tree down, uh, this block and vision, because anybody coming around the corner. Uh, with them using a driveway right there could be an issue and i've seen a lot of atvs and golf carts up there at pretty decent speeds no it doesn't really look like a developed approach it's just basically a trail at this point but well i think a lot of the approaches were basically put in i mean ernie if you did them all you know largely land access of the day but one would think that when you're developing a lot for a house you're doing earthworks you'll do the same thing in a subdivision like we did in Erskine or they do the same thing in town the subdivision gets done a certain way the guy that builds the house finishes its driveway and leaves the grades on the lot but really the location of that the way it's coming down right now is not ideal for how it comes onto the road we've got another one across the cul-de-sac that didn't get a permit that just went ahead and built theirs so we're sort of using the the situations exist all over the place for a lack of a permit or asking questions and that's where you know, I think the standards and the way the system works might be a little bit deficient overall is that communication and, and where we're going with things. But, but I, I guess just like I, I know everybody in that cul-de-sac and like the one across the way, they did put a development permit in. They were required to do slope stability studies. And the only the only improvement that was put on them was to rip wrap the existing culvert because there was an existing approach there. In Blaine's case, on this lot that you're seeing in the picture, 
the municipal right of way ends on the crest of that hill. And again, as your standard states, you're supposed to slope from the shoulder of the road down to the lot. So how can he do that with gas and TELUS in that right of way and maintain the slope you want? Like it, it, there has to be some uh, leeway in this. And especially if he has to come out at 90 degrees. And especially if he has to take the hill, which is currently cut at an angle and hit it head on, you're using less distance to go up the same slope. So, so either the hill has to come down and the utilities are moved, and then what does he do to the ditches on either side? And again, no one else pulls a development permit. Do we have a meter deep ditch in front of that property? And then what does everybody else do? Or does he go out into the cul-de-sac? Like it's such a big, it's, it, 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 I, 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 I disagree with Rick thinking that this is a little more than just a little earthworks building an approach. Like it's, it's, there's some significant work required and, I'm just it, it triggered in me. Where did we end, and where do you begin? Right? Where do we where do we both work on this to make it usable? Justin, then Rick. Um, when I look at this, I understand what you're saying about trying to slow down at the approach. I get all that, but I'm sort of the middle ground in the sense that yes, we have standards; those are our typicals. We allow some discretion. Because trying to create a slope down, it would be difficult in this situation. But when I see this, the sight lines at the tree, that makes perfect sense. Get rid of the tree. Uh, and when you talk about drainage, that's the only reason there isn't grass. That's just all topsoil, natural. Looks like they may have cut a little bit years ago, right, right near the blue sign, to kind of take the crest of that hill out a little bit. But that's all topsoil. It's shedding down towards our road. When we talk about drainage, and yes, we don't have a deep ditch there for it to naturally go to, but at the same point, it, if I'm voting, I want improvements. I want that tree gone, and I do not want topsoil eroding onto our roadway and making a maintenance issue. So should we have some discretion? Yeah, but I, I still think that that permit application triggering this inspection and, and making some some improvements are, are warranted. Well, I, I don't think anybody no, arguing yeah. that there's gonna need to be some improvements like gravel put on top and if they're, they're right in the middle of this process now, they're not gonna gravel it until they know what they have to do. And this is just, this is an RV permit. They wanna be able to pull an RV up on top of the lot, that's it. That's all they want to use the access. So, yes, it was there before. There is nobody in the entire subdivision that's put a new approach in from what the access was originally. Uh, Rick, Larry, and Dave. Well, that's it. It does look like there's been some earthworks on the lot, and a development permit, if we're doing earthworks, would also trigger a lock rating plan, which would then also provide us a detail of how we're planning on getting our driveway down to the road. So, once again, I'll take the middle ground with Justin on a lot of this is there's a lot of things going on here. Being a construction guy, none of it scares me, unfortunately, because we got pretty big stuff and this is pretty minor stuff in my world, but I understand on your perspective how it's a lot of work. I get that. Um, utilities aren't an issue for me, but if we are planning something down the road and we're running utilities to an RV and we're burying things and then we come back later to build a house, um, we haven't done lock grading. We haven't got an approved plan. We haven't done our driveway necessarily the way it's going to be later. Or is all that stuff going to be in the way later when the house goes up? My world, my head, I make all that plan now and I work my way to it um, as I get there. The house may come later, but I'm getting it all set when the trailer goes on it now. We have had the same issues with trailers and other subdivisions as well. And I've talked with Ed a little bit about the maybe the Maybe there needs to be a caveat or a different way of dealing with if we're just tugging a trailer up there, that maybe there's some temporary discretion because it's not a full build out of a house and you don't know what it looks like. But if we start building fences, we start putting utilities in the ground, that's going to be the excuse later to not create that lot better later when a house goes up. So we got a bit of a slippery slope one or the other, and it's it's not cut enough, guaranteed. Larry, 
And when you look at th this example here, just sitting sitting here and looking without being on site looking, it looks like that could could accommodate a culvert to maybe have some drainage in there past that you know those trees. I don't. But when I sit here and look at it, we could you could be meeting an approach piece there and still build up from there. You might have to haul dirt in to cover your culvert, but you, it looks to have quite a dip. Right and there is a, there is an eight inch culvert there. It's not the thirty yeah. thirty centimeter one. That's still up. Yeah. And don't get us wrong, we're not here because of this one. Yeah, it's we're just here because of how it might affect everyone in the subdivision. Because you know, once it happens once, and you say that there needs to be a, a, an approach application mm -hmm. done, I'll, I'll be completely honest with you. It scares people away. I'm not going to apply. I'm just going to build my my cabin, I'm good. they don't comply, but it scares them because they have to put the two thousand dollar deposit in. They've got to do this. They've got to do that. They may have to spend eight, nine thousand dollars to get a whole bunch of earthwork done when it already exists and there's not a problem. It scares people away. That's what happened. I'm just being honest with you. That's what we hear. I'm I'm, I'm here to tell them no. You should apply. You should do all the process because it helps everybody else. If you don't know what's going on, you can't say there's an improvement and you can't get, you know, you don't have the value go up and have more tax and that kind of thing. Dave and then Rick. Rick. We, uh, yes, there was one of them in the area that I look after. And he was going to skate around it and come in a different way and everything else. And we just built an approach and then we charged him for it. So, yeah, exactly. You know, we'll, we we can, we build approaches, but we charge it back to him. He had a little money left over, so we give it back. That's how it went there. I can't see whether it's at the lake or whether it's south of Big Valley. What's different? I don't think that the, the building gate is what's scaring people. It's the like, if if that was your lot or you saw my pictures of my lot, it's. If there's only a nine inch ditch, all the standards that are in there, right? But like your standard says that from the shoulder of the road, it has to be a negative slope to the, the property boundary. That's on the top of the hill. So how do you take the whole hill out? Like what do you how do you how do you meet all the letters of the law? I, I'm saying we've got to give Rick some wiggle room here to, to let us say, like, let's pick the elements of here that work in this case. And that's what I'm hoping. That's kind of what we came here today. It's not to say you don't need standards. Right. It's not to say we don't want to comply. It's saying that in special cases that don't meet the criteria to be able to build it, can we can we modify? Can we have that exception? Are you okay with that? That's what that's what I think we come to ask for. And if our wording, you don't like the wording in the proposal we sent, I'm completely open to like. Well, yeah. I think it be, should be up to the discretion of our public works foreman. If you want to put a mound there or the Thing to make it somehow so you can get the water to run. <clears throat> you want to take the tree out so you had come down that hill so you don't. Yeah, the tree, the tree in the road. Road. Yeah. It's we we've talked like there's been so many conversations about this. Well, and there are people I like me that I'd have to to do this stuff. And well, you know. okay. and Rick and Ernie. So two quick things um, regarding the the width of the property line. This is one of those cases where. You know, if we're wide enough across the ditch, dropping away from the shoulder of the road, that we can accommodate a culvert in the ditch width without going all the way to the property line up on top of the hill. That makes perfect sense. Looks like there's a fair bit of right of way there. So if we're four or five meters off the shoulder of the road at most, we can still accomplish what we want as long as it's shedding into the ditch. You don't have to go all the way back in this case. The slippery slope, I want to remind you of if you remember when we went on the road tour this year we went into buffalo sands and that's where we had a whole bunch of lots going up this way driveways all over the place uh, onto the pavement uh, that didn't have permits and as we went down around the corner if you recall we saw a whole bunch of lots that had their driveway coming straight down and there used to be a ditch there at least the ones on the first part of the way in the ditch was still there around the corner they've been doing their lots, they've been building the ditches and burying the culverts and running their driveway right down to the shoulder of the asphalt. Then we also have a ratepayer request logged in the system where the same people have called in and complained about drainage along the same area. And where I left that request was we need some direction regarding how to fix this because we got to put all the ditches back, right? And at whose cost at that point when they've already developed houses where they've already developed driveways and things are 
they basically build ditches all the way through there. So at least in this particular case, there's a little bit of room with the lot size to do things a little bit differently. And there is there is some logic that says we can still make it work um, if the biggest concern is where the property line is. But when we keep looking around and seeing all the things that are being done, and then we get the service request later to fix the problems they create, those are the things we have to think about. And I'm still of the opinion that the inspections and the compliance with the uh, development permits to make sure things are done right, the grading plans, the residents demonstrate to us what they're building and we do the inspections afterwards to make sure it was built the way they planned it. All of this goes away, but it doesn't fix all the stuff that was done incorrectly or without permits for years and years and years. And that's what we can look at and compare everything to. If that makes any sense. If I recollect, again, on this cul-de-sac here, there was a gentle slope to say, like, from the south to the north, and there's probably about a three-foot rise in there. So, like, and that's where I look at it, like your particular lot, John, of where if we were to put, say, like, a negative slope and then go up into there, you'd be taking an awful lot of your old out of it. You would not be able to physically really drive up there. So, like, I just look at it as long as the vegetation is going to be there, I would have more concerns on the amount of water if we had a real dump of rain that whatever landed on that cul-de-sac, where is it going to go? It is definitely going to go towards the north, and it could be washing out the road. That would be more my concern in there. Another member we heard mention, okay, when you, there are stipulations, say, like, when you build the approaches out in the country. But I would also like to arrange, okay, if you have flat ground, no problems at all. But all of a sudden, if you have a hill, how are you going to build an approach up onto a hill? At least out in the country, you have a half a mile that you can have alternate positions in. You do not have any choice. This is a hill that you have to build on. You cannot take it in any other way. There's so many times you could build the die on all these Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Larry? I, I've got two comments now because of the last comment, but <laughs> not every development in the county is on a quarter section either, Mr. Denner. So there's acreages there that could be on a hill also that would fall into the same criteria. So, but but with this, uh, you you look look at it to the fact that we do do variances on so many things at the, especially at the lake. If you, if you look through all of our MPC meetings, there's a lot of variances. I still think they have to be looked at. Uh, we, you've got there's contractors that work in those areas that just think they can do whatever they want. They tell people they can do whatever they want for access, etc. And, and it's not true. So on a go forward, I still believe it's we have to follow the same rules. What you've brought in about the slopes and the negative slopes is, is conversation that has to be brought in as part of that variance piece. So it you know I look I look at that and I know Rick can move dirt, but I just think. Well, you know, to, to try and move that much dirt to have a negative slope onto there, like, like that's with utilities and stuff. To me, that's not practical. But that's that's he's he's following our by what we create as bylaws and rules to the to what they should be following. We're allowed to the one make the decision on variances. So I, I I think one of my biggest concern was is in the wording when you read it, and granted, everyone in this room knows most people won't read it, so. But on this thing where it says you shall apply, I, I have no one has a problem if if they apply for a development permit, somebody comes out and has a look and says, oh, we might need an approach issue. It's the fact that you have to do it before somebody even looks at it is the way the wording is right now. And I think John would agree in the sense of it it, it just adds that that layer of indecision and unknown when you want to develop your land that says. Okay, I'm going to have to do A, B, C, and D. If if every if there's not a problem, I'm not going to have to do anything with the approach. That will come when the initial inspection comes to look at the property because that's what happens every time. So the fact that it says shall versus may is a big deal in the sense of saying, okay, that I know shall means I have to do it. May means that if, if Rick came out and looked and said, no, everything's fine here. We don't have to worry about the approach. We don't have to do it. Are, are you suggesting that if the wording was along the lines of you shall apply and the director of public works or, or municipal planning 
you may have to make improvements. That's that would make you feel more uncomfortable. Well, the, 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 the way the wording is that. No, no, it, it, I, I'm, I'm asking if that was the wording, would that make you feel more comfortable? In, in the word, the wording is in when you have to apply. Yes, it's, it's, that's that's the issue right now. It says you you shall apply like they the wording on it says the, the uh, then the developer shall apply. It may be required to apply is a completely different meaning. I, I, I can't, I can't get there. And I think we may be interpreting things different. Something has to trigger that inspection. And I think the majority of people sitting here will say, yeah, there's some discretion depending on the situation and topography. But something still has to trigger that inspection. Well, maybe I'm mistaken. That's, that's why you shall apply. Right, but uh, Jacinda can answer that. And yeah. just, I always thought if you make a development permit, somebody comes out and looks first. We do. And in this case, um, it was determined that the approach, as is the previous condition, and there's been some work done since then, uh, would require an inspection from public or operations department. So the inspection then resulted in the list of improvements that would be required to bring the approach up to county standards. So that process first involved our uh, inspection and then followed by an, an approach uh, inspection, which is a $200 fee. And at that time it was determined the list of uh, improvements and the security deposit of $2,000 to ensure that the work was done to the county standards. So that was what was given to the developer in this case. Rick. So very much what Justin's been saying is the trigger is exactly it. The, the application triggers a file, which then gets logged in the system so we can't lose it. Um, random inspections, uh, phone calls. I mean, I hate to say it, but we're all busy and as much as I like driving up there, I find myself probably in Gadsby and by more, more often. It's a big county, right? And we're all busy. But that that application that shall be done if we're going to modify or add an approach triggers a file system, which then triggers the inspection, which triggers everything else that goes along with it. And that's why it has to happen. The development permit is separate to the approach um, system right now. Uh, the approach system is an operations uh, thing, and it's it's uh, uh, what do you call it a policy that we have separate from that, but they handle that when the development permits come in because they know you're going to need access. But definitely if we if we go by, they just come up and have a look all the time, that's probably where we're going to get back to why we are where we are in a lot of cases. Well, and then you file know, number to trigger. That was my mystery in the sense, the way Rick just said it, they're independent, correct? Yeah. And as long as they stay independent, that's not what it said. It's not the way it's worked. And what Justin and I are talking about is the wording is such that it, it seems like it's required every single time. If the approach, if the development office says, "Oh, you don't need it," or you, there was obviously a trigger that said you need an approach application. Well, they're and they're two independent things. That's fine. My concern is the way I read it. That's not the way it's worded. It, it's every time you have to do it. So I guess that's my goal. So separately, if you went through Jacinta's system and you provided a lock grading plan that included the grading and whatnot for your approach, right, that would land on my desk. I'd be able to look at it and see what's going on in the lot. More often than not, we don't get the lock grading plans. We have no idea other than we need access to the land, so we need to have a system that's going to track that. So I hear what you're saying, but the to do the complete job on a development permit is to include a lock grading plan, Tell us what you're doing earthworks wise. Tell us what your approach is going to look like. If all those plans came in, and we had one just this week in, in of all places, Buffalo Sands, and it was a great one, right down to the five meter radius onto the shoulder of the road, labeled and great approach application. But it was also the lock grading that if it comes with all of that and make one plan, it works great. If we separate it, saying I only want an approach right now, then I can go build all this stuff later, but I'm not giving you a grading plan. We don't even know if the approach works. Yet. Right, so properly planned, properly executed, gets us where we're going down the road. And if we're staging construction, 
right? Unfortunately, that's the way my head works, but I you know, we're living at the top of the plan. But um, I understand the frustration, but there's reasons for everything. And the reduction approaches, we have to make sure they get done well. Otherwise, we got to deal with all the service requests later when things start getting done. Can I ask you a question, Justin? Like in an in, in instance like this, where like it obviously hasn't been done right from the start, yeah. what would you suggest? Should we like do what Rick suggests, like do the whole thing, or do it just the piece in front of one? Like you. So, well, we'll recap <laughs> kind of my understanding because we went on a few different talks here. I'll tell you where I'm. At. When we develop a lot, I don't care if it's a subdivision or a first parcel load on a quarter, if it's Hamlet, if it's a subdivision, as soon as we do that application, it should trigger that inspection. Uh, do I think that every typical applies to every situation? No. I believe that our staff should, should be able to recommend some discretionary powers there. Um, there was the topic about uh, fees and securities. Uh, I am not in favor of those. Uh, Dave listed an example where someone didn't do it. We had to use the money to go ahead and build this uh, approach when the developer didn't. So that's where I'm kind of at with these. But your, we have to have that trigger. We have to do the inspection. I'm personally, I'm not opposed to your wording that you're suggesting on number seven. If you, as a developer, you're coming before MBC, you're making an application. If you are going to prove to the satisfaction of the director and municipal planning that the proposed differing design will adequately perform the function, if you prove that to the team's satisfaction, I'm all for giving you some discretion. It, the, the wording here doesn't scare me in the slightest if it makes you feel more comfortable. So that's right. And by the, re the reason we suggested it, there is no mechanism now. Right? Well, there, there doesn't seem to be, put it that way. Well, we absolutely have to have the trigger and the inspections to get the ball rolling. Okay, I'm going to take one more comment from the board and then I'll give you a quick opportunity to recap. But um, we've heard your concerns and, and we're willing to review and um, certainly discretion will be used in cases where there can be discretion used. But uh, Mr. Clark had one final comment. It just comes down to the wording of shall and may. We went through a lot of bylaws, we've got land use bylaw. If you have may, that leaves it all over the map. If you have shell, it says exactly what need. everybody understands going into it, what it should be. So the shell and may, when we go through IDPs and go through everything, a lot of the mays are crossed out and shells are put in for that very reason, because practices in the past have proven that it allows too much discretion the other way. So that's just when you talk about those two words, they're discussed quite a bit. And further to that too, um, it, just because you take out a development permit doesn't mean you shell. <laughs> Putting a new approach if it's not required, but if it is required, you shall. I think that's why we have to shell. But, but the, the the wording from what Justin we were going back and forth on my impression and John's impression and and the people that we're talking about out there in the discussion around the campfire is okay. So I have to do a development permit and an approach permit all the time, all the time, because there's not necessarily an inspection that says. Oh, well, no, this is weird. You need to do an approach one as well. That, that's the clarity. I'm, I'm still not clear on it. If you have to do both. Maybe Rick will let it clear it up. Clear that up. So when you do your development permit, planning and development goes out and does an inspection. Right. Generally, and lately, they've been doing a lot better at it. They would take pictures of the approaches, report site distances to us. So give me something in the office. I can look at it and go, yes, this is going to be a problem or no, we still often will need if there's a minor upgrade or it's still an approach application, but they are getting us that information when they go and do the initial site inspection for the development permit. What happens after that? Only 95% of the time they need to work on their approaches. I mean, I find very few that were actually built well into the center. Different topic. Right? Hey, like I said, and we appreciate your input. I mean, 
this is how we try to improve things and it's, it's valuable and we definitely with your pitches and stuff i mean it does make discussion much easier to see what you're talking about and uh, but is there anything i am going to wrap up this uh, delegation typically we allow 15 minutes for delegation yeah. <laughs> yeah, we we the, the interchange with that so we well. all wings at boston pizza so yeah. Yeah. so anyways if there's any final things you'd like to say before you uh, my, my closing thing would just be you know at the end of the day the the amount of work required to put this ditch in the, how does that compare to us doing greater work in the event of a, you know what I mean? Like, like, what are we fixing here? Like, are we, are we, are we just trying to make it to the standard or are we fixing a problem? Are there complaints from our neighbor? These are, I'm not asking for responses. These are rhetorical questions. Are there complaints from our neighborhood? Are there issues, road maintenance issues right now? Or are we talking about Buffalo Sands and other places? Like, are we fixing a problem? And if, if there is a real genuine problem, let's do it right. I would like to do it right. Like, let's fix it and build the ditch, do it for everybody versus having to throw it on one individual landowner every time a development permit comes in and have these little pockets of proper ditch and culvert here and then it's adjacent to something that isn't that's yeah. all yeah good comment and, and uh just thanks for the opportunity guys uh we've had a good dialogue i've, I've always been impressed with the, you know the dialogue we get when we do delegations here it's great um, uh and uh thanks again for listening to us yeah. well thank you for coming in thank you Okay, and so we'll take that information. Yeah. So moving on to our meeting, our next meeting is set for August 24th. You'll want to do number 11 first, Councillor. Number 11. Uh, oh, wait. Yeah. Okay. We're having a camera session too, yeah? I just focused on it. Okay, so I need a motion to move in camera. Mr. Grover moves us in camera.
Our, we're on live. Um, no, Mr. Clark. I'd, I'd like to bring a motion forward to ensure that MR and ER, which we don't have responsibility totally over, that it is maintained the way it's supposed to be. Therefore, in a case that we just discussed, that the tennis or beach volleyball court be removed. Letter be sent to the people and their fire pit area, and that it be used for what it's intended to be used for. Moved off of the um, off of the off MR. The MR, yes. <laughs> yeah, so they do have the option of applying for an or license of occupation on for the ER. ER, yeah, if they wish, if they wish to, but I don't. Uh, I would make a pathway so so to clear the pathway off yeah. on the yeah, MR. We our pathway system is so important up there. We're going to mop the MR, you know. So is everyone clear to, on Mr. Clark's motion? Mr. Gender. Just want to repeat there, there was vegetation before there. So like, did they haul the sand in? Was it uh, just worked up and then you utilized natural sand? I'd like to see vegetation put back. <coughs> Was treated all the way across the On the old map, there wasn't clearing there, but uh, I don't think there vegetation. There's grass. So vegetation. Yeah, the grass could go back if that's your wish. Then I would accept that and put it Was back there. An amendment. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Motion is carried. James Oldham voted. <laughs> Okay, now we'll move on to 12 on our agenda with the next meeting is set for August 24th. And we need someone to adjourn. Mr. Grover? Uh, all in favor? You guys in favor of adjourning? Oh, yeah, you can. Well, so I'm going to quit talking and wave your hand. You need to adjourn? <laughs>